All right, so uh, hi everyone. Welcome to Physics Meets ML. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, let me say a few words about the logistics, especially for those who have not tuned into our channel before. Uh, if you have questions for the speaker, you can type them in the chat box. Uh, we usually go over them in the Q&A after the talk. Uh, but if you have a burning question, you don't have to wait till the end. Just unmute yourself and ask. But otherwise, we recommend it that you keep yourself muted. Uh, the talk will be recorded and the video will be up on our website shortly. So, um, so let's, let me also start the recording. Okay, so we are very happy to have uh, Professor Kyle Kramer speaking to us today. Uh, it gives me even more pleasure to introduce Kyle, who is a distinguished alumnus of my department. Uh, Kyle received his PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was a Gold Harbor Fellow at Brookhaven National Lab before joining the faculty of NYU, where he's currently Professor of Physics and Data Science. Uh, Kyle's background is in experimental particle physics, uh, working primarily on the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, he's a pioneer at the interface of physics, statistics, and machine learning. He develop a framework that enables collaborative statistical modeling, which was used extensively for the discovery of the Higgs boson. And we are very excited to hear from him today. So please take it away, Kyle. Okay, well, thank you very much, Gary. And thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, so I'm, you know, I've been uh, following this uh, seminar series. I think it's a very, really interesting topic and uh, I'm very happy to join you today. So I thought I would just uh, kind of Take a step back and talk. Of, I gave the title uh, "Explorations at the Intersection of Physics and Machine Learning" uh, that, in that interface, um, and so I'm going to kind of, you know, talk broadly about the sort of body of work that I've been doing together with what's become a pretty, you know, growing <laughs> group of collaborators, and it's a, it involves uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, researchers, physicists, um, uh, applied mathematicians, statisticians, etc. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. A lot of this really happened kind of uh, shortly after the Higgs discovery. I went on sabbatical um, and, uh, and so kind of started this new branch of, of research and I found it very, uh, very uh, uh, fun basically. So, um, so some of the different works that I've done recently when I was trying to think about what to talk about, just to give you sort of a feel, um, it's been a pretty diverse set of projects. So, I uh, had some you know, work about uh, doing classification for uh, these objects called jets at the Large Hadron Collider with tree and graph-based neural networks and, and figuring out a way to what we called QCD aware. So they somehow knew something about the strong force. Um, then had a body of work that was about uh, trying to use machine learning to, uh, for precision measurements of the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and so it's really kind of in the neighbor, you know, both of these first two are really about data analysis. And here, this is relevant, for instance, if you want to try to constrain effective field theory, which is some sort of systematic expansion about the standard model, um, uh, which is one of the kind of high profile targets for the LHC now. Um, oops, excuse me. Uh, there's also been some work about, uh, also on the data analysis side, about trying to probe dark matter substructure with strong gravitational lenses. Then there were some other things that were a little bit more, you know, machine learning -y, like uh, uh, investigating probabilistic programming. Um, it did a little bit of work about using machine learning to model the quantum density matrix. And recently, uh, uh, sorry about that, um, uh, more work uh, with a, a team of people at DeepMind and MIT um, about uh, using machine learning to try to uh, improve lattice field theory calculations like lattice QCD. Um, and then there's been some kind of little side projects with, uh, for instance, uh, Hamiltonian and ordinary differential equations plus graph neural networks to try to model dynamical systems, uh, some extension to that using symbolic regression, um, and, uh, and then recently some work using what's uh, sort of a dynamical programming algorithms and reinforcement learning to try to understand uh, hierarchical clustering of uh, 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 which can happen both in particle physics data, but also in like genomics and, and various other fields like that. So, so you know, that's a pretty diverse set of things. So you might ask, you know, what do these projects have in common, right? So several of them, you know, are aimed at what I would consider like important physics questions and, you know, aiming on having impact in physics, uh, but also many of them are really some sort of like exploration to refine you know, my understanding or our understanding of the sort of pros and cons of different approaches to modeling, 
and to inference and to kind of more generally, you know, how we approach science or, or artificial intelligence. And, and, and it's sort of between two extremes, which on one side, you have the kind of traditional physics-based approach to these problems, which uh, involves like a, you know, insight into what's going on and what you might call a, a mechanistic model um, that's, you know, uh, grounded in sort of first principles. Um, and then a more, you know, kind of on the other side of the spectrum, a more black box machine learning function approximation uh, prediction perspective. Um, and uh, the exploration of trying to kind of reconcile the tension between these two different approaches is, well, I think, you know, led to some interesting insights into AI and ML. Uh, and it's also definitely refined my thinking about physics and kind of more generally about, you know, doing science uh, and, and, <laughs> and sort of philosophy of science to some degree. So, um, so instead of focusing today on some specific application, like one of those projects, I'm going to sort of discuss a few of them and th those kind of broader explorations. And so this is from the abstract is <clears throat> asking the kind of questions about how do we incorporate our physical insight into the underlying causal mechanism into the, what you would say, inductive biases of uh, machine learning architectures. Um, sort of asking the question, is that helpful or necessary? Um, you know, do you, do you need to do this? Are you gaining anything? Um, think a little bit and discuss a little bit about like, why is it that we care if a model is interpretable? Um, and, you know, where do we stand in some sense in the spectrum between, you know, we, we already for sure have a kind of machine learning supercharged data analysis. But if the, if the end point of that is something like a, you know, robot scientist or some sort of AI scientist, um, you know, where are we in that trajectory? So I kind of wanted to discuss that topic a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, how does this whole line of influence sort of influence research in AI and, and ML more broadly than its impact in physics? That's kind of what, you know, that, that was what I set out to do. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to, you know, kind of I have a, a lot of slides and we'll, we'll see how we do. But uh, OK, so the first part that I'd like to start off with is, is what a, a fairly grounded setting, uh, I think. Uh, it's, you know, it's well formulated in the language of statistics. And I'm, I'm thinking of it uh, and it's certainly very relevant for being a physicist uh, and relevant for, you know, AI and et cetera which is that um, there's sort of a, a two-directional uh, uh, or bi-directional <clears throat> relationship between uh, what you might call a theory and the data. So on one side, you know, as physicists, you know, theoretical physicists try to come up with models and they make predictions, right? And so they're making predictions about what the data might look like. Um, you can think of that predictive direction as like a generative model. You know, you have a, an idea of how the data should be generated. And so you're predicting some distribution for what the data would look like. And then the inverse of that is if you, you're given some data, you would like to you know, invert that simulation or that uh, predictive generative model and try to do inference about the theory. Um, and, uh, and so those kinds of inverse problems, I'm just kind of generically calling inference. Now, um, so this is, you, know, you, can, you can definitely write this out very clearly in a statistical formalism, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, but I wanna st first start off with this kind of framework. Now, the traditional approaches in physics, you know, this I talked about this kind of pendulum swing, you know, that if you think about how, like, say, physicists with LHC or cosmologists go about analyzing data to try to infer, for instance, parameters in the standard model of particle physics or, you know, cosmological, you know, parameters or something like that, it tends to be a very handcrafted data analysis. And that, that data analysis is largely guided by expert knowledge and theoretical insights and things like this. And that's uh, served, you know, physicists pretty well over the, you know, centuries. Um, but, you know, recently with machine learning and deep learning and big data, there's the pendulum has swung very much to the other side, which was <clears throat> to essentially, you know, eschew feature engineering, get rid of all these handcrafted features, uh, try to move something that's more in, like an end-to-end -end learning paradigm where you just have data coming in as close to the raw data as possible. You have some well-specified, you know, target uh, uh, goal that you would like to do, and you're going to optimize some system in the end to do that. And the focus is to be sort of, you know, as data-driven as possible. And certainly, you see this term data-driven uh, a lot, and it's usually used in a, uh, you know, uh, with positive associations. Like this is good to be data-driven. Okay. Now, the extremes of these, I think, you know, uh, sort of peaked around uh, when big data was the the the. The, the buzzword of the of the of the year, um, and so you see these kinds of articles like uh, the end of theory and the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. So you you see that people are thinking about like really, you know, radical change to how we approach science, and that 
uh, that you know theory is no longer needed. Um, you also have these kinds of quotes like uh, it's a riff off of uh, all models are wrong and some are useful. And here it's all models are wrong and increasingly you can succeed without them, right? So it's really like a you know, model agnostic uh, data driven extreme. Um, so that's, I think that's kind of what I would, you know, uh, like to sort of start by framing. Now, if you think about, uh, you know, some of the recent workshops that have been happening on, you know, the physics and machine learning interface, this is one that was held at the IPAM at UCLA. Um, I'll just read from a, a few parts of it. So they're talking about, you know, uh, using machine learning either for, you know, with data come from experiments or from simulations, sometimes just like more like condensed matter people would do to, to try to understand the theory itself. Um, and then that's being able to interrogate high dimensional complex data in a way that hasn't been possible before. That's definitely in the purview of, of, of modern machine learning. You can see why this is going to be powerful. <clears throat> um, but you also see things like this, which is that we believe machine learning will also, you know, provides exciting opportunity to, to learn the models themselves. That is to learn the physical principles and structures underlying the data. And this is kind of against the grain of, of saying something like we can do without any models and we don't need theory. It's more like AI is going to discover the new theories. And so that's, uh, you know, it's not quite the same narrative. And, uh, you know, it sounds exciting, sounds ambitious. Um, so, you know, is, is that possible? You know, how far away are we from doing something like that? And you also see lines in here, like for physicists, they not like to just fit the data, but obtain models that are somehow understandable. And so here you have ideas of interpretability and things like that. Um, and then to like impose things like conservation laws and symmetry relations. So again, all of this is just to kind of prime you for the kinds of topics that I am interested in and, and thinking about. So if we go back to this specific problem about, uh, you know, I have a theory that can make some predictions about the data and I would like to do inference in a, in a probabilistic way, uh, given some data, well, what can I say about the theory? Now, I, instead of writing down something, you know, uh, uh, like a, a, a mathematical equation, like a Gaussian or a Poisson or something like that, I'm going to think about a, a particular system and it's actually this, this little desk toy that I have right here. Um, and that's, I'll, I'll play the movie. And so we could imagine that like, for instance, if I held this slightly to the left or slightly to the right, um, it's going to bias uh, the probability of the balls bounce to the left or right. And, and, and I can call that, you know, that parameter theta. Um, and, and I can imagine that, uh, that I would like to infer this parameter theta uh, which is, you know, the probability to bounce to the right by looking at this observed data. So I'm going to think through the, the paths that the balls went through this lattice of uh, up here as a latent variables and where they land at the bottom is like my observation. That's to say the thing that I'm observing. Um, and if I'm, if I want to understand this distribution and how does it depend on theta, so the probability of the data given theta, what do I need to do? I need to integrate over all the possible paths that, that land in that particular location. And you might think, OK, well, that sounds tough. But you know, I know that uh, this looks like a, a binomial distribution because you can either go left or right at each pin. Um, there's you know, some probability of doing that. I, I can analytically sum over all of the different possible ways to do that. And so that's where I get this kind of binomial coefficient out in front. And, uh, and so that should be, that should be fine. Um, now the problem is, as I painfully learned when uh, giving this example for like a physics one, uh, you know, uh, or you know, experimental physics lab uh, example, is that this distribution is not at all uh, <laughs> the uh, the binomial distribution that you would expect for this num number of trials, um, and uh, and so why is that? So I, I took this slow motion video, and I don't know if you can see, but the balls are bouncing around like crazy, right? They're not uh, they're not simply going left or right; they're they're bouncing all crazy. So uh, at this point, I have no idea what that distribution looks like, uh, you know, is. Uh, there's also weird interplay between the, the pitch of these bins and the, the pitch, pitch of the last set of pins. Um, so I don't know what it is, but I could simulate it. And so my, uh, my friend Gunius uh, wrote a simulation for it. And so here you go, you can see it. Um, and, uh, you know, you could adjust the parameters of the simulation to try to match up with the data, right? Now, in a situation like this, I can still think about the probability distribution of where these, you know, balls end up, uh, and it's still an integral over all the possible paths and the ways that you can get there. Um, the problem is that I can't, I can no longer do this, this kind of uh, integral or sum analytically. There's no like simplifying assumption. I just literally have to sum over all the possibilities. And as the latent space grows, the number of the such paths grows, you know, very rapidly, like exponentially or combinatorially or uh, depending on your problem. 
And so that means that th this integral basically becomes intractable. And so that means that uh, trying to, if this integral is intractable, I don't have a tractable likelihood function anymore. So the typical approaches that you're going to use for statistical inference that just don't, don't work anymore. Um, but I can still generate synthetic observations by just running the simulator, right? So, uh, so I can do something. And the question is, you know, can I do inference in that setting? So that, that setting is often referred to as likelihood-free inference. Um, I prefer the term simulation-based inference um, uh, because usually what you end up doing is figuring out how to approximate the likelihood in some way. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, you know, kind of generally I have some black box simulator. It has some parameters, which are the things I want to infer. This is some generative model and it outputs observations X. Um, and so that's the predictive direction. And I would like, to, you know, maybe I can look inside of what's going on, but it's not really clear if that's going to help me. Um, and then based on the observed uh, data X, I would like to then do the inverse and try to do inference. And that's going to involve basically estimating the likelihood function. Okay. Now, this is really important, I think, because science is replete with high fidelity simulators. This is a, you know, I gave this toy example of the, of this, my desk toy over here, right? But like, you know, when we, we do real, you know, real cutting edge physics, you know, most of the kind of, of uh, uh, you know, highest fidelity predictions are not, no longer like equations on a piece of paper. They, they get encoded into computer simulations. And, uh, and they generate something that looks like the observed data and they model the actual instruments themselves. Um, and they range all the way from, you know, particle physics to, uh, you know, how neurons work, how epidemics spread, how, you know, light is bent around, uh, you know, galaxies and things and the evolution of the universe, or how you might uh, try to, you know, visualize a black hole or how proteins fold and all these kinds of things. And so these simulators though, you know, there's one thing is they're generative models, they make synthetic data. They're also implicit models, meaning they, they usually have an intractable likelihood. Uh, but they're also causal models because they, they are based on some underlying mechanism that sort of tells the story about how the data was generated. Um, now, back in 2017, there was a workshop at, at ICML uh, that was uh, on implicit models. Um, and so again, they're talking about, you know, several, several real world phenomena are better described by simulators that do not admit attractable density. So that's the kind of problem I was just describing. They give an example of, you know, particle physics. And then they, they point to like, what are the hot topics in machine learning? So you see things like generative adversarial networks or GANs, uh, recent advances in variational inference, approximate Bayesian computation, which is was at that time basically synonymous with what I, I just described as likelihood free inference or simulation based inference. Uh, now we see this as just one of many techniques for, uh, for solving that kind of problem. Uh, and then there are other things like uh, density ratio estimation, et cetera. So, um, so, this, so there's, this scientific framing is definitely very close to uh, a lot of like cutting edge, interesting topics in machine learning, uh, specifically in the kind of probabilistic machine learning, you know, subfield. Now, so you might just ask, okay, well, we, you know, we saw GANs on the list, so can't, can I just do it like a GAN? So a GAN is also a generative model, say, of images. You take some random noise, you push it through a neural network, and the output of the neural network is formatted like to look like your data, so in this case, images. And here are some examples of some images generated with a GAN. Um, it's an implicit model. It's a generative model. I would not call it a causal model. It doesn't know anything about how these images really came to be. Oops, it's just a, you know, it's just some function. Um, but I can think about, you know, like simulators, say for particle physics, they're also generating synthetic data. Um, they're more causal, but, you know, does that matter? You know, like, so can I just use the same idea for a GAN to try to fit a simulator? And so we did try to do something like that. We called it adversarial variational optimization. And it's set up like a GAN. I'm not going to go through this carefully, but if you're familiar with that, you have a generator and a discriminator. The difference now is my generator is not a neural network with a million parameters. It's a simulator that might only have like five or six or 10 parameters that you can jiggle. And they usually have some physical meaning associated to them. Um, but the, the, the problem with it is that in both cases, the likelihood is intractable. So how do you figure out how to fit, the, fit those uh, simulations or, uh, to the data? And the idea, and, and again, is that you have a discriminator that's the, the kind of adversary that tries to tell the difference between the synthetic data uh, and the real data. And, uh, and, it's, and it's through that kind of two player game uh, that you find a Nash equilibrium that would then give you, you know, the, the, a good fit of the data. Um, now, the, the problem with that uh, in this case is that, you know, and again, you can 
back propagate gradients through the generative model because the generative model is a neural network. Uh, but in the case of most physical simulators, you, they're non-differentiable. They have control flow and all sorts of things in them. Uh, so you can't, you can't differentiate through them, uh, certainly the way that they're written now. Um, and so we introduced a, you know, a trick basically to be able to get around that, uh, which is similar to like what you see with the uh, reinforced gradients and reinforcement learning and stuff. And so basically we, we have a variational model that sort of proposes where should the parameters be. And then that distribution, uh, you can take gradients with respect to that distribution and it will concentrate around the true value beta star. And so that's nice. The problem with this approach though, is it only gives you point estimates. It doesn't give you like notions of uncertainty and things like that. So for a lot of our cases, it's not really solving the, the problem of inference in the, in, a, you know, in the way that we would want to as scientists. You know, it's just the point estimate. Um, but I just want to get that out of the way. So the GAN approach is not going to solve the problem. And GANs, you know, they, they, uh, they're not really, you know, they're generative models, but they're not very interesting generative models from a physicist's point of view. Okay, I mean, in terms of being like a theory of what's going on. <clears throat> now, uh, so since then we wrote a, 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 a paper that was a review of different approaches to simulation-based inference. This is, you know, a whole talk, so I'm not gonna go through it all. But uh, basically, you know, we sort of identify three forces that are pushing the, the frontier of, of, of this research. Um, and, uh, and so one of them is machine learning, which is basically allowing us to work with higher dimensional data um, and then there are other things like active learning, which allow us to sort of work with more uh, expensive simulators. And then there are some approaches where you try to reach inside the simulator and sort of uh, integrate uh, them with, you know, different kinds of technologies or augment them to do something fancy, uh, which I don't really have too much time to talk about. But these are sort of three different approaches that are sort of pushing on uh, the traditional based techniques and, and helping them. So uh, in that paper, we talk about sort of two broad approaches. And so on, on one side, you have approaches where you really use the simulator directly. And on the right, you have approaches where you're going to try to learn the simulator using something like you know, deep learning or something like that. And that, that, that approximate model is gonna be like a surrogate and you're gonna use that surrogate then later for inference. Now, I guess I should maybe pause to say here that you know, if, you, if you fast forward into the future, uh, where you have machine learning uh, you know, models that are actually learning the underlying mechanism, those machine learning based models are going to be the simulators, right? So, so this class of techniques, you know, I'm talking about handcrafted simulators now, but you should imagine in the future that you have uh, simulators that, that were learned from the beginning that have causal stories associated to them. Uh, but before we get to that, we're gonna sort of start by seeing, okay, we already have a, a handcrafted physics simulator can I approximate that thing with a, a neural network in some way? And can I use that approximate to solve my inverse problems and to do uh, inference? Okay, so here's the kind of schematic of what's going on. I have a simulator here. It's got some parameters theta inside the simulator. There's all sorts of latent variables that I, I don't, I'm not gonna see as an experimentalist. Um, the simulator is gonna output some synthetic observations. And then I'm gonna use pairs of the synthetic observations and the values of the parameters that were used to generate those data sets to train a neural network. And the neural network is not going to just take in data and try to predict the parameters. It's gonna take both of these things as input and it's going to try to output something like a likelihood or a likelihood ratio. Um, and so we need to come up with a loss function that's gonna make that work. Um, and then if we can do that and we can learn something that's like an approximate likelihood ratio, then we can do statistical inference. And so that's the idea. Um, and so it's kind of a two-stage procedure where first you do the machine learning piece, and then once you've done that, then you can do inference. And this, uh, this first part is also, you can say, is amortized in the sense that once you've trained this neural network, you can do inference pretty fast. So, um, so of the kind of machine learning-based approaches, uh, these are some like flow charts from this review paper that we wrote that sort of show, you can see how the simulator enters in yellow, um, you, you have different targets in terms of if you're trying to approximate a likelihood or a posterior or a likelihood ratio, they're, they're all, they can all work out. Um, and, uh, but then the, the interesting thing is that some of these approaches use supervised learning and some use unsupervised learning. So I'll say just a little bit about it, but I, I don't want to get into that too much. <clears throat> so before I go into a little bit about how that works, let me just give you some examples. Okay, so first I'll start off with uh, particle physics because that's uh, you know my uh, you know where I come from. Um, so 
Um, so here's the Lagrangian for the standard model. Okay, and it tells you about how the different kinds of fields, you know, like uh, and all the fundamental particles, how they interact, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't have very many free parameters in it. And most of them are quite well measured at this point. Um, and so, you know, so you can imagine I'm trying to measure one of the parameters of this, or maybe an extension of the standard model based on something like effective field theory. Now, the simulation chain is going to start off with these theory parameters and that equation that I just showed you. <clears throat> but then we have software that's going to use things like Feynman diagrams to make some, uh, to try to turn this into practice of what do we expect the data to look like. Um, the, and so this, this figure, this Feynman diagram encodes a probability distribution of the data, uh, specifically describing the energy and momentum of these outgoing particles. Uh, but we don't observe these outgoing particles directly. Uh, we have, uh, if you make a quark or something, you don't see quarks floating around. They radi radiate you know, more particles called gluons and the gluons split into more quarks. So you have this kind of complicated process. Um, and then finally you have stable particles and then they come out and they interact with our detector and our detector is very, very complicated. So simulating uh, one collision at the LHC uh, involves, you know, in the neighborhood of 100 million latent variables. Okay, so the, so the, the ZD here are the latent variables associated with the detector simulation and there are a lot of them. Okay, so, um, and then finally you get to the, what you actually observe in the data. So I'm calling that X. And the simulation chain, which is implemented in software, is conceptually, you know, that here are the different, you know, software tools. We call them Monte Carlo tools, and we call them that because conceptually they're performing an integral. They're integrating over all of the possibilities in the latent space. Um, and so this is it symbolically. The problem is that this integral is totally infeasible to calculate. Okay, you're not going to do a hundred million dimensional integral for every collision at the LHC. So, um, and so that means that this likelihood function is intractable. So. <clears throat> So that's the that's this concrete uh, you know scenario that we have in particle physics. Here's an example where we're considering uh, just a, a theory that only has two parameters theta uh, that I care to infer, and they they're in, they're modifying the interactions of the Higgs boson with the W and Z boson. So, and here the uh, specifically the their forms, and I'm working with data that's sort of 42 dimensional data, so not incredibly high dimension, but certainly too high dimensional to do something like fill a history. <clears throat> And so with these kinds of techniques, we are able to estimate the likelihood ratio very, very accurately. And then we can scan through the parameters and we can look at, okay, this is a log likelihood curve. Uh, that horizontal axis here is the parameter that I'm trying to measure. Uh, zero is the standard model. And the, the steeper this uh, parabola is, the more precise my measurement is. And you see that if you use these kinds of machine learning based approaches and you compare it to the traditional data analysis techniques, it's like adding 90% more data to the LHC uh, for one of the flagship measurements at the LHC. So this is like, it's pretty, you know, this is definitely having impact, okay? I and mean, this hasn't been done yet as a, uh, a study, but that, you know, what impact could be done, but it, you know, it, it says that this would be a very valuable target. Um, and if you look at other kinds of examples, this is a different example for a different physics process. You see that going from the kind of traditional approaches to these uh, sort of machine learning based approaches that use the higher dimensional version of the data, uh, can can lead to dramatically uh, more precise measurements. And so this uh, reduction here in the size of this uncertainty band is equivalent to like many factors of more LHC data. So so this is definitely, you know, high impact is my message. You can also use these kinds of techniques, for instance, to try to understand something about the nature of dark matter. Um, so for instance, if you look at uh, these <clears throat> gravitational lenses, um, there's a, so this is, this orange thing is a foreground galaxy, like you see here, and the blue ring is some background galaxy, and the light is being bent due to uh, strong gravitational lensing. And then you have a telescope that's ca you know, capturing this image, and so you see these kinds of you know amazing rings from gravitational uh, gravitational lensing. And so the, the the interesting part is that there's deep, a lot of information embedded in the details of this this lensed image, and it, it's hiding all sorts of you know cool stuff. So in particular, if this is some galaxy, it's surrounded by a halo of dark matter. And that halo is not totally smooth, it's clumpy. And so, uh, so here are these little blue clumps are clumps of dark matter. And if you look at the mass of those subhalos uh, and the number of them, this is the number density versus the mass, you get a kind of power law like distribution. Uh, maybe it gets cut off at some point. And so understanding this power law distribution and if it's cut off uh, will actually give you a hint about the particle nature of dark matter. So 
So here's a simple, you know, an example that we did. We, we considered a power law distribution where there's a, you know, a parameter to change the normalization and the, and then the kind of, you know, the slope of the power law. Um, so we only have two parameters in, in the, that are, we care about simulating in our, uh, and sorry, we care about inferring. Um, but when it goes to actually simulate it, we're going to draw uh, a bunch of uh, subhalos randomly, you know, randomly spatially draw, uh, distributed around this galaxy. So those are the little blue dots. So the color indicates how massive they are. Um, so there, these are now you can consider these latent variables. For one of these, one of these images, there's all these random subhalos, you know, floating around, and I don't, I'm not going to observe those subhalos, right? But in the simulation, they're, they're, I can, you know, they can have particular values. And once I know where those subhalos are, then I can run a, a simulation of the gravitational lensing, include the, you know, the detector response, include Poisson noise, uh, uh, Poisson, you know, statistics of the photons hitting the detector. Etc. And so we had this kind of simulation chain describing what's going on. And so what we would like to do is from observations like this, infer not what the latent variables are, but infer these population parameters about the power law distribution of dark matter subhalos. So, um, so again, it's the same kind of setup. We run the simulation, and then we're going to train some neural networks. Uh, and then after that, we'll be able to do inference. So here's a, a video where images are coming in, and we have a pipeline uh, that allows like as these images to come in uh, this over here these are the two parameters that i'm trying to infer and it's a posterior distribution that's concentrating around the true value that was used for the simulations so this is you know this is pretty cool i mean it's pretty amazing that you can go from these images uh, to back to all the all the way back to these kind of fundamental parameters um have you <clears> done it have you, have, have you done it on your own simulation data of something like this yeah, so in this example, this was like a proof of concept. So we used uh, our simulation to both okay, to it train was already it and also okay. to, Got it. Thanks. So, yeah, so, and this is definitely a, a simplified simulation, but it's just to try to kind of proof of principle. So later, though, the point is that, you know, you, you add more and more complexity to the simulation. And, you know, and for, for example, the galaxies we use in the background were perfectly smooth, you know, so you would want to start to model the background galaxies so you get more yeah, yeah. texture. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, so um, so these kinds of things are also being explored, for instance, for gravitational wave astronomy, where you want to you know, look at a waveform come in and you would like to quickly get a distribution of where do you think that source was on the sky. Um, and you, in this series, there have been a couple of talks uh, about the use of these kinds of approaches for um, cosmological inference uh, and you know, astrophysics and things like that. So I'm just pointing to these previous talks. Now, so I, I'm going to kind of just, you know, here's my sort of slide just because I want to hit you over the head with this, which is, to me, this is, I mean, to me, this is an important moment in the evolution of science. I mean, if you think about how important, like in statistics, you know, likelihood fits and Markov chain Monte Carlo, those were incredibly important, right? And being able to do, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, have numerical versions of complicated likelihood functions and fit them was very important. Uh, but what do you do when the likelihood function itself is intractable? Like that's what we're, that's the point we're at now is figuring out how to do inference when you actually have a simulator as the model. And that allows you to go to like a much, you know, richer form of modeling. And, uh, and if you also think about it in the kind of, you know, broader sense of what we're doing as scientists, you know, there's this connection between the microscopic model of what's happening, the kind of reductionist model and the sort of macroscopic or emergent phenomena that you're observing. And if you can bridge that microscopic macroscopic divide uh, and have some sort of effective statistical model that says what the macroscopic phenomena looks like, parameterize it in terms of the microscopic parameters, like that's a big deal. And so to me, this is like important and it's gonna take more years for this stuff to mature and et cetera, but I think it's exciting. Okay. So, okay, so that's like kind of the, the first part and now, so I want to say a little bit about how these models work, but I, I'm going to be a little bit fast, but I want you to notice that as I'm going through it, I'm not saying anything about the, the, the neural network architectures. It's all completely abstract. I don't, and, uh, and which is a little bit ironic because, you know, a, a large fraction of my work is all about um, different machine learning, you know, neural network architectures and uh, inductive bias and these kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, so for me, that was like one of the kinds of things to try to reconcile. So, and I think it's a fair question of like, do we care what the inductive bias of these machine learning models are? Or can we just take some black box thing and 
as long as it learns the function that we want, then I don't care, right? So, um, so that goes along kind of the narrative that I used uh, for several years when I was trying to explain machine learning to physicists, uh, you know, sort of, you know, five, six years ago. Uh, and I would often try to describe machine learning as kind of applied calculus of variations. And I, let me, start, I'll give you sort of a sense of what I mean by that. Um, so when you do, you know, calculus of variations, you're going to have some, uh, some, some functional, you know, in this case, like a loss functional. Um, and you're going to have some class of functions, S. And you would like to say, okay, within that, you know, uh, class of functions, find the, the function S hat, which minimizes this loss function. Um, and you can use calculus of variations to do that. Now, it's, you know, it's difficult to work in the space of all functions, especially, you know, for complicated, you know, things that depend on data and et cetera. So you can think of a lot of this as, you know, what we often do as physicists, right? And, and not just physicists, but we come up with some variational onsets, some highly flexible family of functions. Um, and so, and so they're parameterized by, I'll call it phi. And so S of phi is a family of functions. And then instead of, you know, optimizing with respect to function space, I'm optimizing with respect to the parameters phi. And then I, my hope is that if I have a sufficiently flexible family of functions that, you know, the, 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 the point in this, you know, family of functions that minimizes this loss is going to be pretty close to the, the optimal, you know, function out there. And then you can just think of neural networks as essentially very highly flexible family of functions. And of course, you know, that's, it's not just that, you know, uh, machine learning also includes like all of the optimization algorithms that are effective even with millions of parameters and theory about, you know, why generalization works like it does and things like that. But, uh, but from a kind of practical point of view, you can see, you know, at this point, um, in a lot of machine learning is like has an applied feeling and you get to put your emphasis on the loss function itself and does this, you know, idealized, uh, uh, you know, uh, extremizer of the, of the loss functional do what you want to do, right? You know, is it, so it puts the emphasis largely on designing a loss function. Okay, um, so this is a, you know, a Facebook tweet or whatever post from 2016, um, you know, talking about this way of, of, of say, thinking about things. Yan Lekun, you know, actually responded to me on this and was like, yeah, he agrees. And I, you know, so I just, it's not like a completely, you know, foreign way of thinking about uh, machine learning. Um, so if you look at now in this kind of, you know, array of different approaches to simulation-based inference, let's look at the kind of supervised learning approaches. So one thing here is that if I imagine I have data from say just two classes and I'm doing something simple like training a binary classifier, um, then I can consider here's some random, you know, loss function or functional, um, I haven't motivated it. Um, I can use calculation, calculus of variations to find the, the function S that, that uh, minimizes this thing. And this is the function that, that does it. Um, and, and so, okay, well, why, why do I care about this function? Well, it turns out this function is one-to-one -one with the likelihood ratio. And if you know about hypothesis testing, then you know that the, the likelihood ratio is the optimal way of separating two distributions. Um, and uh, and this, this function right here, if in a Bayesian context, this is called the Bayes optimal classifier. So these things are very well motivated from first principles. And now the question is, okay, this loss functional, you know, involves expectations over the, over the data. Uh, well, I can approximate those expectations if I just have samples from the distribution. So if I have data, I can approximate this thing. And so here's the form of the loss functional with, you know, empirical data. And so I can think of this as, you know, I'm approximating the loss functional and then I'm going to use some neural networks to uh, you know, approximate this family of solutions, run gradient descent, and hopefully I'm doing something close to what you would do if you could do it all analytically on a piece of paper. Um, and now that, that story I just told was for just two simple hypotheses, like you know, cats and dogs. Um, but you can also lift this to the situation where you have a parameterized family of distributions. Um, so you know, it could be cats of various ages or, you know, uh, or something like that, or me as a physicist, it can be the, the data at the LHC as a function of the EFT parameters or the data from some cosmology, you know, uh, uh, surveys as a function of the, you know, fundamental cosmological constants, right? So, um, so you can do the same kind of likelihood ratio trick where you train a classifier that gives you S and you kind of rearrange it to give you a likelihood ratio. And then you can use this likelihood ratio for doing inference. And I call this thing a parameterized classifier. So that's kind of how that's you know how one of those approaches that I described works. Um, the other approach that uses unsupervised learning, I'll be very quick here. But again, here you have a, 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 a you you have a simulator, so you have a generative model that can produce data x 
uh, for any value of the parameters data. So you just kind of randomly scan over the parameters data, you generate some random data, you make a bunch of uh, theta n, xn pairs, and then you use the modern approaches to doing conditional density estimation to try to estimate you know, the, the, the probability of the data given the parameters, which is also known as the likelihood function. Um, and, uh, and so you can use things like normalizing flows there. Um, and again, you have a well-motivated loss function where subject to a constraint that it's a normalized PDF. Uh, if you minimize this thing, you just get that the, the, the function that's gonna minimize this is the distribution itself. So it's a way of doing density estimation. And you can approximate this loss function with samples. So, so both of these things kind of fit into this narrative that machine learning is applied calculus of variations and I don't really care about, like, I'm not saying anything about the architectures of these functions. I just want a very flexible function. Um, so one of the first reasons that you might care is that sample efficiency is a major concern. If you're going to train one of these things, you have to generate a bunch of simulated data. The simulators are expensive. And, uh, and so, you know, you would like to have as few simulations as possible. Um, so one of the things that we did to try to address this um, you know, so one thing that you can do is to try to work with a smaller function class. Um, and, and so that's, uh, so, um, and, and as long as that function class is still big enough to include the one that you want, then you might hope that the training will be more efficient, right? Um, the other kind of thing that you can do is actually change how you train them in the first place. So still work with the same function class. Um, and here we're actually going to leverage the fact that we know something about the mechanism inside the simulator. We're going to reach into the simulator and we're going to realize that, okay, while this, the, the likelihood is intractable because it has this intractable integral, um, if I think about for one particular path through the simulation uh, where I know the values of all the latent variables, um, so I know kind of locally what's happening at, at all the different parts inside the simulation, I can say, well, you know, how much more or less likely would this particular simulated event be? under two different hypotheses. And so you kind of go through every single step of the simulation and you sort of say, okay, well, if it was this setting or this setting, you know, what's the likelihood ratio? And sometimes you can also take like the derivative of the log likelihood uh, locally at every single, you know, every single random choice, you know, uh, in the simulation. And you can calculate these things uh, oftentimes. And if you can, then what happens is that you can take that data and I'm gonna do this super fast, but you know, I would like to, this involves the latent variables and I don't get to observe them. I would like to convert that into this object, this likelihood ratio based on just the observed data. It's not so obvious how to do that. It turns out that intuitively it does, it's doing what you want. The, this information is kind of scattered around the, the true ratio that you'd like to infer. Um, and then you can show that, okay, here's a loss function uh, or loss functional that when you minimize it with calculation of variations, it does what you want. Uh, you have to do a little bit of work to show that that's what, what actually what you want, but it's true. Okay, so um, so that's great. And and uh, there's something similar that you can do if you have this uh, kind of, you can take the, the, the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to the parameters of the simulation. There's another loss function. And so you can take, before you had the, the, the training data in the supervised setting was just cats or dogs, or zero or one labels. And you're doing binary classification, and so the, the the training signal was very weak, and you're trying to learn this red curve based on this kind of training data. And then this new setup where you get to probe the thing and you get to see what the mechanism is, um, then you actually have this much richer training data. And so as a result, the the training is just dramatically more efficient. So here's a plot that shows on a logarithmic scale the number of training samples, and then that the estimation error, like how accurately we're estimating the likelihood, and you see that you know instead of 10 million samples, you know, with something like 10,000 samples, you know, so several orders of magnitude less data, you can, you can actually do better in terms of how well you can estimate the, the, the likelihood. Here. So, and it's not surprising if you look at this picture that it's gonna be a lot easier to learn, you know, in this setting than in this setting. So, so this is, I think, you know, already kind of on the road towards, uh, okay, I still have a flexible function class, but you start to see the value of being able to probe inside of your simulations and to do something with the mechanism itself. Um, so, um, so I'm going to come back to that topic uh, in a little bit, but that was kind of the first thing to kind of motivate uh, that you're going to care about the, the types of models you're working with uh, from the point of view of sample complexity. You know, how much training do we need? So the next one I want to talk about is about going kind of from doing statistical inference to more like design, okay? And, and 
And so here I'm going to think about something like reinforcement learning. So I'm sure you've seen, you know, AlphaGo and things like that that can uh, play a game of, of Go. And so they're looking at the board and they're trying to decide, you know, where should I move next, right? Um, and it's interacting with the environment and, and making decisions and things like that. So this is, uh, so you have your robot making an action, interacting with the environment, getting some sort of reward, updating its state, and you're in this loop. And you can think of this as analogous to what uh, scientists do, say, when you're trying to decide what experiment should you do next, right? So you, for instance, uh, you, you, you performed an experiment, you have some current you know, knowledge of the world, uh, and you're going to decide what experiment you should do next. That's the action you're taking. Um, and so then once you do it, you're going to interact with the environment, which is to actually perform the experiment and gather data. And then you're going to interpret it, like do statistical analysis, update your knowledge, like a Bayesian prior to posterior update, and then just do this in a loop, right? So that's one way of thinking of it. Uh, you can formalize all of this in terms of I have a, you know, theta, like a, a space for the states of nature, my parameter space, a space for the data, a space for the types of actions I can take. I have a statistical model for the data given the states of nature. Maybe I have a prior over those states of nature. Uh, I'm going to have some sort of decision rule that says, given the data, what action should I take? I'm going to have a loss function. And then you can define these quantities like the risk and the expected loss and things like that. And you can try to you know, uh, minimize these things and try to you know, come up with a, 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 a way forward. right? And so this is related to things like experimental design or control or model-based planning and all these kinds of words. Um, and so one way of deciding what experiment you should do next would be to choose the experiment that's going to maximize your inform expected information gain. So you, before you do the experiment, you imagine you're doing the experiment. You know, if I were to do this experiment, what would I expect would happen from my, my current prior to the posterior I would have with the synthetic data for this hypothetical experiment? And so then you're going to you know, scan over all the possible experiments that you could do and then optimize with respect to that. And that's the experiment you should perform. So here's kind of a picture. You've got, uh, you know, you've done some experiment, you have some observed data, you have an inference engine that sort of does say Bayes rule or something and goes from a prior to a posterior. And now you're at this stage and you're trying to decide what experiment should you do next. And you're going to optimize the experiment by uh, uh, you, know, cons you know, trying to scan through and optimize the expected information gain. The expected information gain itself, how do you do that? You have a simulator that generates these synthetics experiments. For each one of them, you do Bayes, uh, you get it out a posterior, and then you calculate, you know, compared to the prior and the posterior, what's the information gain. You do this many, many times, and you get the expected information gain. So, so you can do this. What's important to see is that you know doing inference here is sitting inside of a loop, right? And and then this loop is sitting inside of another loop, right? So uh, and if you think about how expensive it was for me to do inference in my examples with like the dark matter experiment or the Higgs experiment with a simulator, it's already really expensive just to do this Bayes operation one time, right? So if you want to get into the business of a designing experiments where you just say here's my simulation, now go optimize things. It's going to be expensive. So, like, uh, so you know, sample complexity is going to be very, very important. But just for a kind of proof of, you know, proof of principle, I, I worked with some people and we we put together a system to do this, um, and I we called it kind of uh, active sciencing instead of active learning. Um, and so the specific example that we chose was, you know, again a particle physics example. Um, so you may have heard of the photon and the Z boson. Well, the photon and the Z boson are actually some kind of mixture between what we consider the more fundamental fields, which are often referred to as B and W. And, uh, and so there's, a, there's a, you know, a mixing angle that describes it, and that angle is called the Weinberg angle. Um, and, uh, and so you'd like to measure, say, this Weinberg angle. Um, and so physicists know a good way to do that, which is uh, to uh, look at what's called the forward-backward asymmetry uh, you collide, for instance, two electrons, and you say, look at muons flying out, and you, you look at some asymmetry in the detector, and so here's this, the angular dependence of, say, one of these muons in the detector, and you see that, you know, different distributions, and it will depend on this Weinberging. So, so first, we would like to use simulation-based inference to infer the Weinberg angle, but secondly, we would like to use this, uh, at, you know, experimental design loop to try to optimize what experimental configuration you should do to get the most precise measurement. Uh, but we don't want to tell it any physics. We just want to give it a simulator and some neural networks and some algorithms and see if it can do it. Uh, so we did that. And then and here's a plot of the expected information gain 
as a function of the center mass energy of my uh, imaginary E plus E minus collider. And, uh, and what you see is that there's a minimum around 90 GV, which is the mass of the Z boson. So that, this means you're not gonna gain very much information. So that's not a good setting, but just below and above the, 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 what we call the Z boson resonance, the expected information gain is large. And that is, if you're a particle physicist, you may have learned this in your graduate studies. And here's a plot from like the paper from long ago from, uh, that shows the asymmetry, the spore backward asymmetry quantity as a function of the beam. Uh, and basically, as you push through the resonance, there's no effect, but just above and below resonance, that effect is the strongest. And so this totally makes sense. And this was all discovered through these kinds of machine learning type algorithms. So I think that's pretty cool and something that looks a little bit more like AI. Um, and so I put out, you know, something about this and Danilo Rosende, who you may know, thought it was pretty cool. He's like, you've got the whole scientific loop in a notebook, um, which is, you know, half true, but I think the important part here is to remember that A, the simulation that we used was the same one that was, you know, it was a perfectly well-specified simulator. So there's no mismodeling going on. Um, the other thing is that's really important to remember is that the space of experimental configurations was very highly constrained. And this example is just the, the energy of my collider and also like the polarization of the beams. Um, it, it, you're not asking the question of like in the open world of possible experiments that you might do, what experiment should you go do? That's a much, much harder problem. And currently the only thing I know that knows how to do that is a human, right? So, um, so when you work in this kind of open model of experimental configurations, you, you know, you start to appreciate how good humans are at designing experiments. Like if you wanted to do this, you know, algorithmically, it's just incredibly expensive. Um, and then the other point here is that Okay, here I'm also testing a particular theory. It only had the Weinberg angle that I wanted to measure. What if I'm, you know, what if I want to imagine new kinds of theories that kind of generating new hypotheses that you might want to test? That's certainly not at all covered in what I've described, right? So, so this is also very hard. So I think if you step way back and you think about like the scientific method broadly, um, you know, the things that we're doing well with and with machine learning and AI right now is a relatively narrow set of things. You know, you. Uh, you know, it's about, you know, extracting information from the data when you have well-specified, you know, models and all these kinds of things. Uh, but in terms of like developing general theories, generating hypotheses, uh, developing testable predictions, designing new experiments, all of these kinds of things are not really part of the story currently. So, um, so this is, I think, if we want to go towards like AI robot physicists, we're going to really need to make progress here. Um, and this is the place where I think uh, it matters that you have an interpretable model versus some black box model. If you had done what, you know, what I just described with some kind of totally generic, well, I did do it with a totally generic neural network. Okay, you get done with step one, but uh, you can't look at the results and, and figure out like how, like what experiment should I be doing next in some kind of general way, or it's not going to help you formulate new hypotheses really. Um, and that's because currently humans are still in charge of doing that. You know, at some point in the future, maybe, you know, machine learning and AI will be able to generate new hypotheses and things like that. But we're not, I can say we're in general, we're not really there yet, except for in like kind of specific cases. So this gets back to basically these kinds of things. If you want to do this kind of stuff, uh, you know, I think it's interesting and we should move in that direction, but we're, we're, we're you know, still some ways away from it. Um, and, and also this is kind of gets to me why we care about interpretability. Um, and more kind of abstractly and more formally, uh, essentially everything that I described to you, um, including the experimental design and the inference part, they worked at the at a level of, of thinking about scientific problems that are, uh, you can call association type problems. There are problem, you know, questions you can answer essentially uh, if, you, if you understand the statistical distribution of the data. Um, and so, and this is like, you know, so, um, and, and, uh, but, but I guess, so this is a, from a, a, a Judea Pearl's uh, ladder of causality. And the point here is that there's this set of questions that you can answer, which is a lot of what you see in machine learning is only one subset of the kinds of questions you can ask. There's a higher, there's a higher, sorry, a higher level of questions, which you cannot answer even with an infinite amount of data. And they require being able to intervene, make interventions on a system and see how that system responds. And so when you think about babies playing, you know, they have, a, they wonder like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I do blah. 
And so, and then they do it and they interact with the environment and they see what happens. And, uh, and, and, and if through that interaction, you're, you're able to answer questions, which are like a, a broader set of questions than what you can answer in like kind of purely association level statistical terms. And there's yet a higher level of questions, which are called counterfactuals, uh, which are sort of like, well, what if I had done type of questions? Um, and these kinds of you know questions are also you're not going to ever be able to answer no matter how much data you collect. You, you need to be able to, uh, and, and importantly here they come with assumptions. These kinds of questions to be able to answer them, you need to provide assumptions, uh, and that's usually in the form of a causal model. And those causal models look a lot like what we physicists call theories. Um, and so this can be made more formally. I'll just point out this paper that talks about. Uh, this kind of this sort of nested set of, uh, of, of questions it's almost like you know p and np and the zoo of, of different types of of, uh, of uh, you know algorithms and, and things like that but here it's a different you know conceptually what kinds of questions can you answer and they and they make this formal in a measure theoretic sense that that, that really these are you know uh, different uh, different levels of questions um, and there's a simple example which maybe i'll skip because of time but these are three different causal models that all produce the same joint distribution for the data. Um, but they, they, the story about how the data came to be is different. And if you could intervene on the system, like for instance, you could go and you could set the value of X to three in this example, then you would see that the distribution of Y in these different cases will be different. And so that means that um, uh, from a, even if you had an infinite amount of data, you would not be able to distinguish these three situations. But if you can intervene, you can distinguish these situations. So they're really like a different class of questions and when we think about like, you know, what we're doing in, in science, we need to be able to answer those kinds of questions. Um, and so a lot of the machine learning, you know, researchers start to increasingly appreciate that, you know, it, we need to move beyond association level questions and start to, you know, embrace causality. And so here's Yashua Bingio talking about, well, what if our, our machine learning models actually, you know, had the right causal structure? Um, and so saying, well, you know, maybe we'd have be able to get away with smaller sample complexity, be more robust to distribution change like systematic uncertainties, be more effective in transfer learning, things like this. And here's some discussion from you know people that you may recognize. Um, and then there are you know other messages along these lines. So this is Peter Vitalia, who I, I uh, collaborate with, who's coming from a cognitive science point of view, and he's talking about you know uh, model building. It's not, you know, it's, it's, we're not just talking about inference, we're talking about building models. And if we want to generate hypotheses and build models, how do we do that? And, and, uh, and, you know, and Tenenbaum says, you know, intelligence is about model building uh, and it's beyond just recognizing patterns. And so there's a lot of emphasis in his research about uh, compositionality and, uh, and kind of relationships between different entities and things like that. Um, and then, more, more, you know, very recently, uh, I was at, at a workshop where uh, Stephanie, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pronounce her last name properly, uh, uh, was talking about connections and trying to formalize some of these notions of inductive bias. So I, I see that where I am on time. So, um, uh, so I wanted to say a little bit about this. I have more slides that I guess I will uh, just kind of flip through a little bit, uh, which really explore this this part. And to me, this is like. Uh, you know, very, very interesting. So, uh, so a lot of the work that I have been doing has been, you know, intuitively around this question. And it's about, you know, how do you impose the structure that you know should be there on the on your machine learning models. Um, and, and so that kind of gener generally comes under the term inductive bias. And there are different strategies like compositionality, encoding different relationships, uh, inc incorporating symmetry, incorporating causality, scale separation. All, these are different strategies that are out there. Um, and so I'll, I'll just skip past this. So this was um, maybe you've seen some work that I did with the, the MIT and DeepMind team related to lattice field theory. In this example, we, we sort of know that the, the distribution we're trying to model has directions that are, are kind of not physical. And so the distribution should be, you know, should be invariant in those directions. And uh, there are other degrees of freedom that are physical and, and the, the distribution can be non-trivial in those degrees degrees of freedom. And so we would like to somehow encode this type of symmetry into the models. Um, and so Fiala uh, gave you a, a talk about that uh, a, a while ago, so I'm not going to get into it. But we've done a bunch of work about how to include gauge symmetries and translational symmetries. Um, and that stuff has been really fun and interesting. Um, 
there's been some work about uh, you know dealing with like if you have a bunch of objects and there's no uh, you it's just a set of things like particles hitting your detector you would like to have a permutation invariance and so uh, I collaborated with Hagai and he gave a talk about those kinds of of those kinds of models and I think just generally we're seeing the the pendulum swing back a little bit towards a situation in which of kind of hybrid models or what I, I call physics aware approaches where you're trying to inject something about your knowledge of the data generating process into the, the architectures themselves in the form of some inductive bias. Um, and you know, the, and that can be done in various different ways. You may still have black box components, but you'd like those black box components to kind of align with a uh, certain identifiable phenomena. And, and, uh, and so there's, you know, a bunch of different work like this. This is again, you know, Peter Battaglia's stuff, a lot of work with graph neural networks, tree-based models and things like that. Um, there have been, you know, really exciting work where you, you, you model these kinds of dynamical systems with graph-based models. Um, it's not surprising that the nodes on the graph are going to correspond to like your, your objects, your planets or whatever you want. Um, and the edges will correspond to things like forces. If you used a generic, you know, feed-forward neural network, you would have, you would not be able to identify those, those things, and there would be no alignment between the architecture and the phenomena. Um, but when you have that alignment, then one of the, you know, you can, you can train them, and then you can make predictions. But you can also then go to new systems that you haven't seen, and and this is a zero-shot generalization. Like I've never trained on a system with this many objects, but it's kind of learned the physics, and so it generalizes to new kinds of systems that it hasn't seen before. Um, and we generally, you know, we extended some of this work, for instance, uh, to say, okay, you know, if this is the kind of data going from, you know, time step n to time step n plus one, uh, that uh, you can, you know, you can use a graph neural network to try to predict what's going to happen. Uh, but I know more, I can put more inductive bias there. I know, for instance, a dynamical system. And so I, maybe I can learn the equations of motion and just hand that off to a numerical integrator and it will just numerically integrate into the future what's happening. And then my, my task is to learn the dynamical system. And so we did some work where we used a, gr a graph neural network to learn that dynamical system. That's what's happening here. The graph neural network is learning that function. Um, and then we said, okay, well, we also know there's Hamiltonian dynamics. So really that, that the dynamical system is very specific and it should go through a scalar bottleneck for the Hamiltonian. And so we, we trained models like this and we see that they do generalize better. Uh, they, they, they generalize longer. They also generalize across, for instance, different time steps, different numerical integrators. Uh, and you know, none of that is kind of surprising, uh, but it's, a, you know, it's, it's sort of more, exa more examples that this kind of structure can help. And recently you see, for instance, that this type, some of the things that we, the phenomena that we were seeing in these studies are aligning with uh, the work that you see from, you know, from DeepMind, et cetera, about what they're calling like, you know, uh, algorithmic reasoning and this kind of alignment of uh, kind of algorithmic components uh, with, I mean, machine learning architecture with sort of algorithmic components, which to me is very much aligned with this kind of what's the causal generative model for the data. Um, so there are more examples that I won't really be able to go through. Luckily, this one, uh, Shirley Ho presented. It was just kind of an extension of the same work that I, I was describing, but we actually go further and we try to run symbolic regression to see if we can actually learn the equations themselves. So in some symbolic form, and we're, we're successful there, for instance, learning spring laws and, you know, uh, one over r squared laws and things like that. Um, and uh, and some, again, some of the phenomena that we saw, you know, in those studies align again with this, this uh, algorithmic reasoning perspective, which is very new. Um, and then there's a, an example that I had from jet physics, which uh, I, I kind of showed some of this a little bit before. This is quite different in that you have a stochastic uh, model for how the data came to be. Um, and this was some of the early work that we did where we said, well, the neural network, why don't we make a neural network that looks like the data generating process and has this tree-like structure? And we were going to still use it for a, a simple binary classification task. But you see that, you know, it has, you know, orders of magnitude fewer parameters and still performs very, very well. Um, and so, so this kind of work, while it's still kind of old, I think is pretty interesting from this point of view of algorithmic alignment. Um, this was trying to solve a classification task, uh, but uh, uh, but um, Matthew Schwartz and, and, and company uh, extended it into a, a sort of a generative model where they wanted to generate data that looks like uh, a, a jet at the LHC, but instead of using a GAN, they used uh, this model being read kind of from the top down. So it's a generative model. It's an autoregressive model. 
And uh, but since it's structured like the causal part of the, the physics story, you can ask a question like, what's happening at say one of these nodes in the tree and compare it to the physical simulation. And what you see here is that the neural net, like the machine learned generative model where the architecture has this physics, you know, physics based inductive bias, you know, what's actually happening, the random numbers it's generating actually align with the random numbers that are generated from an actual physics simulator. So this neural network based model, uh, you know, it, it is a causal model in that sense, and, and it's interpretable. And so this is, I think, is pretty cool, and definitely to me, like, in the direction that we want to go, if we want to try to start to learn uh, what is the mechanism. Like in, in some sense, this plot right here is the mechanism, and so uh, you're actually able to inspect, you know, what's going on inside. And so the, uh, so the, uh, uh, I mean, I say again, when I say this, this is the mechanism. Uh, you know, in the physics generated generative model. This is what you. This is the piece of information you encode. You, you say, "I think I know the splitting function," and you use QCD to, to derive it. And so the fact that the the neural network based model is learning this this piece of information that's not directly observable, it's latent information that aligns with the splitting functions of QCD, is, is pretty interesting. Okay, so um, so that's where I will basically end, and then I will kind of zoom way out and say that. Uh, you know, I am not really like doing machine learning research to try to, you know, push forward the understanding of like why deep learning well works as well as it does. Uh, several people are. Uh, Linka, who gave a, a talk here, you know, some some time ago, is I think you know one of the leaders in that area. And and so one of the things that I like about her framing of things, you know, because she comes from a physics perspective, is that there's this interaction between the data itself. The architecture you're using and also the optimization algorithms you're using for learning and they all interact in some complicated way and uh and so using toy models are very useful for trying to understand the theory of deep learning and i agree with that point of view but this way of framing it is still kind of at the association level and so i would like uh you know uh, suggest a generalization of this 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 message which is that we we extend the data generating process not to just be a joint distribution over the data but to also include, you know, causality, like mechanistic models, and, and to start to ask the questions of what can I do if I can actually intervene on the system? Um, and so here you can actually start to answer these kinds of questions in the same sort of theoretically grounded way that Link is doing. And that I think is like a really interesting pathway. And so I know I've gone on for, you know, an hour, so I will, I will uh, stop here. So the conclusions basically, I, I sort of already said this about, to me, this Simulation-based inference is a is a legitimately important uh, you know a moment in the kind of evolution of science. Like there's a new capability, which I think of as like really actually very important. Um, I think that these hybrid approaches to modeling, uh, where you try to align the architectural components with the causal mechanism, is important for a number of reasons, including, for instance, if we want to have a a path towards some sort of AI that can generate hypotheses and design experiments and things like that. And, uh, and finally, this point that uh, I think that doing machine learning research in the context of these causal generative models or simulations is like really a, a, a good way to proceed in terms of uh, furthering the theory of deep learning, uh, it, especially if you like, want to start to include concepts on causality. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I will take any questions. So thank you, Kyle, for the wonderful talk. Um, we have one question in the chat box. Can you read that? Or I could read it to you if you can't. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, can I comment on the relationship between simulation-based inference and using generative networks? Yeah, um, uh, and, and Yana said the question. Yes, yeah. so um, so I think, so So I would say that, uh, let me see if I can go back to one one figure that I think maybe will, will help, um, is that, um, in some sense, if I, if I go back to this plot, so I, I'm comparing uh, what happens in like a, a generative neural network like a GAN, and, and, and I, I'm hoping you're somewhat familiar with the GAN, but the basic idea here is that you have a, a function, that's a neural network, that's going to take as input essentially just random noise. And for every one of those, uh, you know, for some value of all these random numbers, you're going to take that as input to the neural network, it's going to go through and there's going to be an output and the output is going to be formatted in the space of your data. So for instance, it might look like a, an image. And so then if you draw another random number and you run it through, you'll get a new image. And so this is a generative network. 
and uh, I mean, a, a generative model. And it's interesting in a lot of ways. It's learning the distribution of the images, you know. Um, but it's, uh, but you know, it's. It, I wouldn't say that it has any understanding of what's going on of the physics. You know, the fact that it encodes the distribution itself is, to me, not really what we're after. Um, for instance, it wouldn't like if I compare that, for instance, to a simulation at the LHC. It also takes random numbers and generates data that looks, you know, like this, the real data. So you can ask, what's the difference? Um, and you know, okay, sure, it's written by physicists by hand, so I kind of know what's going on inside. But practically, what's the difference? Well, one difference is I can say, well, what happens if like the the power goes out uh, for this part of my detector? Right? I can run my simulation and intervene on that part of the sim simulation and generate new synthetic data that's going to look like what it should look like if the power goes out for this part of the detector. Um, and so that is, you cannot do that with a, a GAN. A GAN has no idea. It's never seen examples of what data looks like when the power went out, right? So, so the fact that that's why I consider these things, you know, causal generative models. Um, and then when you talk about simulation-based inference, there's a lot in common in the sense that, uh, you know, trying to invert uh, invert the, the GAN has a lot in common with trying to invert the simulator, um, but uh, but the, the simulations usually they you know they're they're kind of causal. So that's um, so that's to me it's I mean, a the, more interesting set of questions. The main thing that's different is that you have decided what are inputs and outputs for the GAN and what is inputs and outputs for the simulation. This isn't that where it all is. That's why the GAN cannot do the zero cannot do the no power. You haven't given it the ability to do it. I, I, I think it's the, the ability to have different inputs and your decision of what is inputs and outputs from a model, I, I think affects all the things that you can do with it later. Sounds like a platitude, what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I mean, you can, you, you know, in some sense, I don't really need to think about, you know, that yes, there are random numbers as I guess, guess the input, but I can think of it really as just a distribution over the data. Um, there's different ways of implementing it, but th this distribution, of, it's not just one distribution over the data, it's a, and it's not just a conditional distribution over the data, it's like a distribution over the data where I can go and I can intervene in a, a number of different ways. Um, and also I can, I can, I, I, they have physical, they have some meaning to them, right? So like, uh, if I wanted to uh, intervene where I'm imagining a certain kind of intervention, the fact that the simulator is structured into components it means something uh, means I know where to go into the simulator to intervene. I have some. I respectfully submit you're saying you have given it different inputs than the gun has. When you say it has a structure and I know where you can go to intervene, I, I'd like to think of it maybe as an input possibility. No, no big deal. Sure. I, I, yeah, sure. I mean, I think uh, you know, input's a, a fairly vague word, but yeah, sure. You can think of it that way. I mean, I think, it, it, and it doesn't need to be a handwritten neural network. Like when I gave this example of a neural network, if the neural network is broken into components uh, that, that that have some kind of semantics associated to them, then I know where to go find them. And you can call them inputs or modules or whatever you want to call them, but there's semantics that allows me to go find that thing. Yeah. And those kinds of semantics are what's key to, for instance, you know, when I did this example of zero shot generalization, uh, at some point, I need to know how to reassemble the components to solve the new problem because the shape of the input is different. <laughs> so I need to like build a new model on the fly, and uh, and, that, and to be able to build a new model on the fly, you need some notion of, of identifiable components and how to remix them. They don't have to correspond to what a physicist thinks of as the, you know, the ingredients. They could be some abstracted, you know, you know, machine learning alien intelligence components, but they there need to be some notion of semantics and when you get to the point of you want to design a new experiment or generate hypotheses you need to be able to interact with that semantics in an yeah. efficient way yeah yeah and, and in a gun you have given you have a particular way to interact right which just doesn't map very well onto like any human concepts <laughs> but, but can, I, I, can, I, can, I, can i comment on this okay. this goes on to the gun part uh, so normally i'm using dropout right a little bit in, in the in the generator for the gun isn't this kind of intervention as well, like switching off parts? Okay. I say? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly an intervention. It's just, a, it's like a, and you know, it's a, it's an, I mean, I mean, if, we, if I take a GAN, you know, it's a function and, you know, so in some sense, in some sense, it's a causal model of like what happened at this node of the neuron to that node of the neuron, but it's not a very 
th th those nodes of the neuron don't have semantics that are interesting from a physics point of view, right? Like the, so, I mean, you know, sure, there's a, in a very, you know, practical sense, it's a causal model, but it's not in a, in a way that's useful or interesting for like designing new experiments or interpreting what's going on. Um, if you somehow get to the point that you, you know, your GAN has like convolutional filters and you've probed it and you know that this convolutional filter, you know, lights up because there's a cat face or something, then, you know, it starts to be, it starts to be interesting, but it starts to be interesting precisely because you had to do some work to build this relationship between the semantic things in your head and the architectural components in the network, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. May I? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Marina is also trying to ask a question. So, uh. okay. Uh, so this was my question, the one you just answered. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. Just, so, yeah. Thanks. So, mine, mine was uh, uh, along the lines that you said about interpretability. Okay. So, I, I had a friend who left and went to work for the dark side in Wall Street and wrote a lovely paper who's called uh, Reconcilable Differences. Uh, there were three different models of the market observing completely different observables optimizing completely different optimize you know objective functions and all the buy and sell decisions were the same which basically means that there is a gauge transformation between the various models so you can look at the points and you can interpret them as masses and springs you can look at them and they can be conjugate to whatever you know to pneumatic liquid crystals dancing they can be so what i'm trying to say which i think is not, nothing particularly deep is that there can as long as something is one to one with something else you can interpret it as particle physics, uh, as uh, charge physics, as uh, collision physics, uh, right? I mean, so I, I, what I'm trying to say is that you can imbue, a, maybe this is the inductive bias that you're saying, but, but there is oodles of different structures that you can put in, which on, the, on your data are completely equivalent and one-to-one. -one. So there's no real reason yeah, for that's... choosing one versus the other. What? Well... I think that the symmetry, I mean, I agree that there are, uh, and that, and in some sense, like if I want to model this distribution, I could use a GAN, I could use a different GAN with a different architecture, I could use a normalizing flow, I could use a whole bunch of things that might all equally well describe this distribution of the data. Um, and, 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 and there may be some way for me to make a, an alignment between the sort of randomness and latent states of the one network and another, but to me that's, still at the, the the point about being able to do those changes as is, is a kind of a, of the point of view of this association level uh uh you know type of, of question so if you want to be able to do an intervention you have to be able to identify those components as we already described and the problem is that you know under these kinds of you know uh one-to-one -one remappings or if you want to call it a gauge transformation or a bijection or whatever a, you want conju to call it, a, conju a conjugacy a duality sure. anything Yes. I'm just saying that the, the, the piece that you can identify in, in one parameterization might be spread out and distributed in some super weird way in the other one. And so they're not equivalent in that sense. So if you so if you want to be able to make interventions and you can't identify the components because they're spread out and scrambled in some super weird way, then it's not useful for answering those other kinds of questions. In principle, maybe it's there, but in practice, it's irrelevant. Okay. Yeah, my, my, my last stupid comment is that that's in the end, that's then anthropomorphic. You, you know, you have all of this, it can be viewed as Fourier modes or as points in a discretization. The main question is, in the end, after you have done all of this, which of these things are one-to-one -one with knobs that you, like Kyle, can turn? I, I'm just trying yeah, to say that, I... that this, this part is post-processing, I think, maybe. Well, I, I think it's an important point, though, because I, you know, I have asked myself that question as well. So I think my point of view is it's not so much that it's anthropomorphic; it's it's a matter of uh, what is the agent that is going to be using the model to do the 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 kind, you know, to be trying to solve the next sure. level of questions, so the intervention type questions or the counterfactuals. That agent doesn't need to be me or a human or something like that. It doesn't need to use like an you know uh, an ontology that aligns with what I think of as like you know springs and masses. It could be any weird you know thing that it wants. But the important thing is that you know the the eight here we go is that the agent that's trying to do this kind of stuff it needs to have the same. Not, it, not. it needs to know where to find it, right? It, it needs to, this is a different agent that's interacting with this model, and it needs to know where to go find it and how to interact with it and how to intervene. And if it can't do that, 
then it cannot answer these, it cannot do these kinds of tasks, right? So until we have AI that's doing the interventions, if it's still going to be humans, then, the, then it's important that the humans can identify those components and interact with it. And to me, that's why uh, interpretability is important for humans right now. In the future, that might not be the case. As we, as we increasingly have systems that can do this, then we can free up how it is that they want to represent stuff and they can design their own inductive biases that fit well for them. You know, that's fine. Um, Fair. Thank you. Thanks. So, much. so yeah. Uh, Shabra, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to thank Carl. This was this was a great talk. Um, we um, I, I, I work with an industrial AI type company and we have kind of been playing with the, the concept of mixing physics with the AI and learning because um, even wow. at the adoption and the industrial level, you can't just be only statistics. Sometimes you need to guarantee, sometimes you need to um, to really learn given the structure. So this was, this was very enlightening for me. Thank you, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, definitely people that do, you know, business things and, you know, they, you know, even like ad companies and stuff, you know, they, they do very much think about these things from a causal inference side, like, you know, if I jiggle this in the way that we, you know, uh, you know, in our product, like, you know, are, 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 you know, how are people going to respond? And so they do, you know, causal modeling and they, they care about it. Um, so, but thank you very much for the kind words. Thank you for the great talk. I have a question about the causal perspective. If I was studying a question of thermodynamics, which is essentially a state function where, you know, the properties of my system, you might say they are quote unquote caused by the parameters that I'm picking, but it doesn't depend on like mechanics on Newtonian. There's no time involved. I'm just looking at this. I mean, do you have any thoughts about connecting that to this causal reasoning. Can I still think of this as a causal system where I might change my interaction strengths and cause a change in the thermodynamic state point I would then visit, um, but it's a different type of causation as opposed to you know the interaction causes a motion to happen at a subsequent period of time. Yeah, no, it, it, thermodynamics is like definitely one of the it was very interesting to uh, wrestle with when thinking about causality. Um, and there's a, there are a few people like Bernard Schulkopf uh, that does machine learning research, has a background in physics, uh, works with physicists, um, and uh, has written a beautiful book about, uh, you know, uh, causal inference from a machine learning perspective. And, you know, in the introductory part there, uh, you know, actually talks about thermodynamics. And so one of the things that's interesting there is that, you know, if you think about just like the ideal gas law or something, you know, uh, you know, you're saying like a relationship between pressure and temperature and volume and things, and and uh, and you can you can ask yourself like, okay, well, it's really just like an equation that these things should be related in the following way, and it's not really clear like who's causing what or if it, it, the causality is actually a thing, right? And and uh, and so y there, there's a, a sense which, in which you know there's there's another sense in which you know, if I have a piston and I push down on it. You know, I am making the volume smaller and I'm making it hotter, right? Uh, and the pressure higher, and all of these kinds of things. So, um, so I think that you know, I've tried to kind of reconcile that for myself. And I guess where I end up with that is that if you think back to the scale separation issue, you know, it, 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 the microscopic scale, there is a you know, there's atoms bouncing around, and and there is a causal model, and you can you can break this the you know when you drive things out of equilibrium, you know, the the causalities arrows start to like appear again, right? But if you do things kind of slowly and things are generally in equilibrium, then you know it's kind of a, starts to be irrelevant, and then you don't really see something that looks like causal arrow of time. You just see a, a, a relationship that's like a, you know like something like the ideal gas law. Um, I don't know if that's partially addressing what you, you're you're saying, but it is true that when you get into uh -huh. these situations where, for the effective model, you know where you move slowly and things are adiabatic or whatever, then causality is not as much less clear in a situation like that. It's more just like some relationship. Um, in which case, um, you know, 
it's not really necessarily a problem. It's just that like you're you're not going to be able to. There will be maybe different causal models that you won't be able to. Uh, to uh, they'll be degenerate with each other. You won't be able to tell the difference between who's causing what because mm -hmm. it's essentially a delta function. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good question. That's worth thinking about. Uh, you, you know on your own and find something that sounds satisfying because <laughs> it's a, a tricky one. Yeah. Okay. Last chance to ask Kyle questions. I don't see any more questions on the chat box. Um, so I guess uh, we will uh, bring it to a close. So thanks, Kyle, a lot for the wonderful talk. And uh, we'll meet again two weeks from now for the next seminar. Great. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for all the questions. Yeah. And, thanks uh, a lot, Kyle. It was great. Good. Thank you. I hope you feel better. Oh, second shot. Thank you. <laughs> I am starting to feel it. So yeah, yeah. I decoupled the last little bit. So. Go, go, take a, go take a nap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I had a FIFA, so I, I think that means your immune system is working. Huh? Yeah. One hopes. I mean, yeah. Mm. I